The bass is dropped on a rainy Wednesday morning in Seattle. Have we turned into Seattle? That's what it feels like these days. Are we going to have uh, grunge music for all of the ins and outs this morning? I, I like grunge music for all the ins and outs. But uh, no, we are in Atlanta, Georgia. It is soccer down here. It's not soccer over Cascadia, even though it feels like it here <laughs> lately with our weather uh, that is sitting on top of us. Jason Longshore, John Nelson here with you this morning. Jarrett Smith will be joining us shortly. It's a wall pass Wednesday, which means you guys have questions. We will try to have answers. Whatever your questions are about, we will try to answer them as we go today. Lots of different odds and ends type of stuff to get into on a Wednesday during the international break. You have the U.S. women who finished their 2018 schedule with a win yesterday. And there's a great piece about one of the veterans of that team. We'll, we'll get into that. This morning, the U-17 women start their World Cup this morning at 11.50 uh, against Cameroon. That's on FS2 and I believe Univision Deportes as well as the U-17 Women's World Cup kicked off yesterday. We have U.S. and England on the men's side tomorrow, and, and we'll get into everything from Wembley. Brad Gazan is there. Darlington Nagby is not. Wayne Rooney is there. Uh, Tyler Adams and Aaron Long from the New York Red Bulls are there. We'll get into everything with that as we go as well. Last night, we had another stoppage time live over at Fado Irish Pub in Buckhead. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. The The actual attendance has been really cool for these, and it's it sparked some good conversation, not just with the 92.9 crew and fans, but fans and fans having conversations and, and leading to stuff. So that's really cool. Uh, we had Jay Riddle and Miguel from Siempre United join us yesterday. And let's start with a clip from Jay talking about, we, we kind of took some of the conversation we've had this week about culture and the Atlanta soccer culture. And, and Jay's been a big part of, of shaping that culture, in my opinion. And here's Jay from Stoppage Time Live last night. What I love is that Atlanta soccer is not a culture about you should do it like us. It's, it's a culture, and I think you're a huge part of it, as all the supporters are. It's a culture of saying this is how we do this. This is how Atlanta does this, yeah, not you that do we're you, better than you. And we'll do us. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I think this is also, I mean, to Atlanta United fans and people watching, don't get caught into that trap, you know. It's one thing when you have a game that day and you're, it's banter. Sure, sure. But if you're sitting outside, the game's done, and you weren't even in, like a supporter of one of the teams involved in the game, and you're just going out of your way to attack something. Oh, well, why do they use that dumb song? Or why do they do that song after? Or why do they? Well, because it's Atlanta, and yeah, Atlanta be, has its own Because thing. it's their own culture. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you, you shouldn't respect it. Right. On that point, Atlanta United's become a very big thing in our city. Can it get bigger? Oh. Oh, scary big. I, I, I think so. I think we saw that. Because it feels scary big already. I think we saw that with the playoff game on Sunday. Um, you know, we, it's expensive. Like, that's, that's the thing you, you got to think about. I mean, Atlanta United tickets are not the most expensive, but they're probably in the upper half of, of uh, you know, ticket prices in the, in the league. And when you start, you know, you may, even if you're a season ticket holder, you've already done – your payment plan or whatever from that year. Well, now you're paying to you know more money for each ticket. We saw that now with the MLS Cup hitting people, and people were like, "Wow, man, this is really hitting my wallet." But well, what I am Atlanta seeing, United has nothing to do with that. But no, but what I am seeing is that people are hitting the buy button and right. then complaining. They're not, right. Right. No, that's a great point. There right. are people just yeah. saying, "I'm not going to go see this product. It's yeah. not worth it." I don't, you know, why should I go see this? People want to see this, and they're willing to pay for it. And, I mean, that means we could have other arguments or discussions about whether uh, you should have to pay more for it or things like that or the prices. But at the end of the day, you know, 70,000 people are paying a lot of money to come out and see this team. And the thing is, it's not even just the 70,000 that were there on Sunday. I feel 
Jay from Stoppage Time Live last night. If you want to see the whole thing, you can watch over at facebook.com slash 929thegame. Uh, it will be available as a podcast soon. Uh, that'll be up on the Off the Woodwork folder on iTunes, Stitcher, every, everybody's favorite pod catcher. Uh, our other guest last night was Miguel from Siempre United, El Travieso. Um, the optimistic one. So, so me and Miguel, I think, are on the same page with most things. Um, <laughs> yes. We took the conversation from culture as a whole of the Atlanta United Nation to how the Latin culture has blended in with what Atlanta United fan culture is. Because it doesn't always happen this way. Um, in some markets, it's, it's very separate. In Atlanta, up until Atlanta United, it was completely separate. It was like two separate worlds that nobody really knew about. So here's Miguel from Siempre United podcast uh, talking about that side of the Atlanta United fan base. And how has that been for you? Like, how has it, has it always been warmly received? Has it been weird on either side? Like, how has that worked, kind of blending everything into a uniquely Atlanta soccer culture? Well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of us, a lot of, uh, well, I'm, I'm saying us in La Dose because I'm yeah. very, very involved with these guys. And uh, um, this is something that we were waiting for a long time. I mean, Arthur Blank hit the spot with Atlanta United. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, like I said, we were brought up with soccer in our countries. Right. You know, I'm from Ecuador, and I remember my dad carrying me on his shoulders going to the game every Sunday. And that's where most of these guys come from. You know, uh, Uruguay, Argentina, Mexico, Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, you know, the, you name it. I mean, everybody is just like down there, uh, third world countries just have soccer. We don't, we're not that uh, rich in sports. So what we have is that, that the unique sport that we can worship, if you can say, and go every Sunday to, to see, you know, somebody kicking the ball. And uh, when we came here, everything is different. Everything changed, and we had to adapt, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, with this team, we have the excuse to embrace this uh, MLS called like uh, English con culture, yes. basically, and uh, add, if you can say, add that little stuff that we can put on, on the table for them. That's perfect. And, and, and that combination is what we have right now that I believe is working out. Yeah, Atlanta United's fan base is, is very diverse, and I think the game day experience is very diverse, and that's just not the case everywhere. The other thing from Miguel that, that I thought was really interesting, and, and he's not the only one who has echoed this, for people who have grown up watching MLS and watched MLS grow up, I think those folks have a different perception of the quality of Major League Soccer compared to somebody like Miguel, who had not followed Major League Soccer until Atlanta got a team. And Miguel watches soccer from all over the, the hemisphere. Uh, he's from Ecuador, watches Argentina, watches Colombia, watches Liga MX, watches Copa Libertadores, Sudamericana. And, and he talked about how, look, it's not quite there yet, but it's not far off. And it can be there very soon. I think people who have watched MLS struggle in the past still hold on to that. It's, it's the same conversation that we've had about MLS 1.0 and comparing it to, you know, your grandparents who survived the Depression and always kind of expect that to come back around. And it feels that way with the MLS 1.0 mentality and the MLS is not that great of a league and it's never going to be that great and we should always just sell players and blah, blah, blah. People who are new to it and don't have that history and watched, you know, Tampa Bay Mutiny and Miami Fusion go away or, or watched 2005 Rail Salt Lake and Chivas USA and, and watched some of the struggles of those times, I don't think they're infected with that mentality. And I think they see the league very differently. And I think that's why your newer teams and newer markets that come into the league are growing faster and are pushing the league forward. They just don't have that baggage. And then I think that fresher perspective, I'd like to see that fresher perspective infect everybody else and have everyone in these quote unquote older markets, the 1.0 markets, sit there and say, well, why can't that be us? Well, why can't it be you? 
take the steps and make it the way that you want it to be. Don't just sit there and accept something for what it has been in the past and, and, you know, go all droopy dog or schlep rock or something and go, you know, Oh, well, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. No, no. The idea that Atlanta United and its fan base has been as inclusive as it has been and is as universal as it is and has an on the field product that is exciting both on the pitch and in the experience and is putting wins on the board and is competing for trophies and is generating levels of success and levels of growth to continue the growth and the success later on, a positive cycle begets more positivity. And I think that you have all of these other markets who look at you and go, well, you know, well, we've just never had it that way. Okay, then make it that way. Don't just stand there. Do something about it. And I think that that, that to me is what's frustrating at times is that you see folks who sit there and say, well, this is the way it's been, so this is the way it has to be. No. No, it is not. And all you have to do is sit there and take those steps forward, desire for change, and work toward change. And I think that you, that if – Everyone can take the example of what has been going on here over the last couple of years at SDHHQ with Atlanta United. The steps will be different in each and every market for each and every team, but the goal is the same. Work forward. Be inclusive. Everyone works forward. The the rising tide quote that we have is one of the, the hallmarks and the tenets of the show. And then everyone improves their perception of the game, and the game itself improves. Yeah, but this is not a Pollyanna... You know, oh, just believe it and it'll come. I, I'm not going to BS no. the, the MLS 1.0 mark. No, I'm, I'm no, going to no. be clear here. I'm going to be very clear. You have a b- different battle than Atlanta had. You have a different battle than Cincinnati will have, than Nashville will have. Miami's a whole different case that's very unique and different from everybody. But new teams that have come into the league have a completely different set of circumstances than New England, than Chicago, who came in in 98 than D.C., than whoever. It's a completely, Dallas, it's a completely different conversation. So just to say that, well, do exactly what Atlanta did or model what Atlanta did and everything will be just fine, it won't because you're not starting from a clean slate. You're starting with a perception of local media saying, well, this league almost went away 10 years ago or almost went away 15 years ago or, man, I remember back in the day. You're going to have that, which wasn't here. So you have to have patience. You have to take the longer road. But you have to, and this is from the fan base, from the team side, from the media side, you have to freshen up your approach. You have to understand that Major League Soccer is in a completely different place at the end of 2018 than it was at the end of 2008, let alone 1998. That's the the thing here. So to say, like, okay, well, Atlanta United has an inclusive fan base, so go have an inclusive fan base. Yeah, do it. You should because it's the right way to do it. However, that doesn't make the stands full for FC Dallas. FC Dallas, as a club, has to embrace the the 2018 version of Major League Soccer. As a club, they have to embrace that this is not small time. This is not arena football. This is Major League Soccer. And you have teams in this league who are drawing 70,000 fans. This can be a big deal. If we allow it to be, the club has to embrace that. The local media market has to embrace that and understand this is a product that is worth covering. Dallas, as a club, has to provide a product that is worth covering. The fans are part of that. The club has to embrace the fans because the fans have a huge hand in creating a product that is worth covering and, for casual fans, worth buying a ticket to. There is no obligation for a soccer fan or a sports fan in a market to buy a ticket to the game. There, there's no obligation to it. You have to be persuaded to do that by something. Atlanta, it's an easy persuasion because it's the hot thing in town right now, and it's a good product. Other markets, it's a harder sell. I'm, I'm tired of excuses about why it's not full at Red Bull Arena for the second leg of a conference semifinal. There are challenges there. The club has to work harder to overcome them. They have to. 
because accepting that, okay, it's just not going to be full for playoffs, it's not okay. That's not where MLS is anymore. The fan base has to work. The club has to work. And they have rebranded. You know, this is not the old Metro Stars days. It still hasn't necessarily changed the mentality all the way. And that's a good product, too. So what's missing? And that's what the club has to figure out. The league is is on a very severe upward trajectory. And I hope that some of the markets that are struggling to catch up do learn from Atlanta United, but don't think that it is an overnight thing. Because it wasn't that way here. There was a lot of work that went into making Atlanta United, Atlanta United, starting from the day it was announced in April of 2014. To make it what it was at Bobby Dodd Stadium on opening day, to make it what it was at Mercedes-Benz Stadium on the first day that stadium opened for Atlanta United. That's a lot of work. That's three years of work. It's going to take probably more than that to change the mentality in some of these old school MLS markets and fan bases. But you have to put that work in, and you have to commit to it. If you put out a first-class soccer product in this country, you will find an audience for it. Period. There is nothing stopping you from finding an audience if you put out a first-class product. If you can't find that audience, you need to look harder. And sometimes you need to look outside of just the soccer bubble to find that audience. You put a first-class soccer product out in this country, you will find people who will buy it. I don't know if everyone understands that sometimes. But Dallas, New York, Colorado can be great soccer markets. They need to be for this league to continue to grow. That's where we're at. I think last night the conversation on Stoppage Time Live talked about an aspect of it on the fan side and that inclusive culture. The other part that that Jay and I were talking about a little bit after we finished was the other part of that inclusive culture is to new fans, is to casual fans who become hardcore fans. And that's something that I think has been very unique about Atlanta. There has not been a velvet rope type of thing about the supporters and about the culture. It's been very welcoming. Somebody shows up new to a tailgate and they don't know what's going on. I've watched people from every supporters group put their arm around that person and say, hey, welcome, here's a beer, here's some food. What do you want to know? What can we help you with? That's been very cool. That is what hardcore fans who want to watch the game grow should do. And it happens on the lower division level. It's a little bit harder because it's harder to get casual fans into a lower division product, but it can happen. It can. It's growing. There's no excuses anymore is what I keep coming back to. It's not a small-time sport. It's not a sport that people don't know. This is not 20 years ago. This is not 30 years ago. So no more excuses. Put out a first-class product no matter what level you're at. Work to grow your fan base. You can find an audience. It's honestly that simple. There are different steps for each market. There's different steps for each club at each different level. But that's the basics of it. Put out a first-class product. People will come. We're going to take a break. Come back. Wall Pass Wednesday questions throughout the day. We'll talk U.S. Women's National Team as well. Stay with us. We will be right back. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. 
Hey, hon. What you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No. I'm asking you questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo. Do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Welcome back. Soccer down here. Wall Pass Wednesday. We'll get into some of your Wall Pass Wednesday questions in this segment. But first, let's thanks, thank you to our new sponsor, EnclosedLaundry.com. That's E-N-C-L-O-S-E-D, Laundry.com. If you're looking for a special gift for the woman in your life, this is an easy way to do it. It's not flowers. It's not a teddy bear of the month club. It's not anything like that. You pick the styles you want. They take care of you. There's a 100% fit guarantee, so if there's any issues, you will get it solved. You go to EnclosedLaundry.com, use the code down here, and get $35 off of any multi-month gift. Thanks to Enclosed for supporting soccer down here and believing in our show. Check them out, EnclosedLaundry.com. John, Wall Pass Wednesday. Yes. What do we have yes. on the Twitters? Well, first question comes from Joe Boss after his Bruce Buffer impression that he starts his uh, tweet with. Very nice. Are there any current roster players we might lose in the expansion draft? And it's a couple of different ones along the same vein, so I'll start with that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell at this point. The, the way the expansion draft will work is probably the better conversation at this point. Um it's sim. It's, I think it's the same exact setup as it has been the last few years. Teams can protect eleven players. Uh, there are some limitations about protecting internationals and domestic players. I don't think those will really apply to Atlanta, based off who they would probably protect. Homegrown players and Generation Adidas players don't have to be protected. So your homegrown signings are good. Miles Robinson question would be if he graduates the generation adidas program this year didn't play a ton so it's he's kind of borderline so we'll have to see how the league handles that one it's it's always a interesting dilemma because generation adidas is kind of just decided at the league office like okay well they've played enough they've graduated oh they haven't played enough they haven't graduated um two years usually guys get a third year if they haven't played a whole ton He's right in that borderline. So that would be an interesting one if you have to protect Miles as opposed to he's automatically protected due to being Generation Adidas. It, there's a good chance you're going to lose somebody in the expansion draft because of the depth of this team. But I think what people always look at when you go into the expansion draft for MLS is they're always looking at, well, this great player is available. This great player is available. You got to put your 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 head into the brain of the expansion team because they're not necessarily just looking for great players who are on big contracts that they might not want. The contract number is a big part of it. The age is a big part of it. Generally, you're looking for guys to fill out the core of your team, whether it's the bench or your substitutes. You might find a starter at a good number there. It can happen. But you haven't seen a ton of high-profile guys go in the expansion draft and, and stick. I mean, Atlanta United in the expansion draft going into 2017, you picked Donnie Toya first because you had the first pick. You flipped him to Orlando for a super draft pick that ended up being Julian Gressel. Uh, pretty good piece of business there. That worked. You, you picked Clint Irwin and traded him right back to Toronto for, I believe, allocation money. Okay, bonus. 
Uh, you picked Mikey Ambrose. Been a good pickup. Who else did you get in that expansion draft? Efforting. You don't have to. That tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> You're not getting top flight guys. So, who could Atlanta lose? It really depends on who Cincinnati signs ahead of that. That's the bigger question is where are their holes? Um, I've thought for a while that a guy like a Mikey Ambrose could be up in the expansion draft again. It's going to be hard with only 11 protected players to protect him. He could be a guy that would be very valuable to an expansion team, as he was here in Atlanta. I think Mikey has shown that he is a potential starter in this league. He hasn't had a long run of time as a starter. But when he's had those opportunities, he has delivered. So that would be a worthy gamble if you're FC Cincinnati, depending on if they need a left back or not. Um, guys like Andrew wheeler Amenu, who... If you followed him in USL, you've seen he can play a lot of different roles for you. He's a great player to have on your 18 because he can play as a right back, a central mid, a defensive mid. He can play as a left back. He's versatile. That's valuable to have in an 18 where you have a guy, one guy on the bench who can play three, four, five different roles. Romario Zach Williams, Lloyd and Alec maybe. Can with the others. Okay, Alec Can ended up being valuable. Zach Lloyd was injured, but it was worth the chance to do it. But Again, these are the types of guys you're getting in the expansion draft. Romario Williams is another one who could possibly be available in the expansion draft just because it's going to be hard to protect him. So I think everybody freaks out about the expansion draft, but don't. It's one player you might lose, and it's not going to be a starting-level player, even if you have to leave a starting-level player unprotected. Expansion teams have to worry about their international slots. They have to worry about their cap. They have to worry about allocation money. They're generally not looking for that big impact player here because a lot of times the impact player that is left unprotected, there's a reason why, whether it's a big salary number or what, it just you don't see big moves happen in the expansion draft. So I would think it would be a depth piece that you might lose because this team has a lot of great depth. And the Clint Irwin deal was Mark Bloom and the Am. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. You did get Mark Bloom for it. Okay. So you got a player who, again, could have ended up being a good outside back, and he had injury problems, and you were stuck. So you got some allocation money. You got a player, a depth piece. That's what you're generally getting out of the expansion draft. And Joe also wanted to know who might we protect other than the, the homegrowns and the Adidas, and then how many can we protect? Well, you can protect 11. Um, it's, it's early because you don't know a situation like Miguel. You know, there's a, a very good chance that Miguel is going to be sold immediately after this. Um, are you going to have to protect him? Are you going to have a deal in place before that? You never know. Um, and a deal in place is different than a deal being announced, too. Don't don't forget that. I'm trying to think. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a situation that I have to dig a little bit deeper into it because you do have situations sometimes with guys that we don't know about that have, like, a no-trade clause. Okay, you have to protect them because they can't move in this type of scenario. So that's a spot you have to protect. Uh, your designated players are not automatically protected, so you're going to have to protect them. So, you know, Joseph, Barco, LGP, Gazan. I mean, I'm just going off the top of my head. Uh, Gressel, you're going to protect. Tito, you're going to protect. Um, Rometty, you're going to protect. Nagby, you're going to protect. You know, you are going to have to make some tough decisions. Players who are out of contract, you're probably not going to protect. Players who you decline their option, you're not going to protect. Players who have an option that you... Uh, well, no, your options are going to be picked up before that, so never mind. That's not going to apply. Um, this is the condensed timeline, because look at it. If you go to MLS Cup, December 8th, 
your expansion draft is <laughs> December 11th, and you've got to have your protected list in 24 hours before the draft. So tough decisions get made very quickly. These are things that the front office is, has to think about right now. I'm glad I'm not one of them because this is a roster yeah. that you're going to have more than 11 guys you'd want to protect. You're going to have to run the risk with some people. And that's just where you're at. The Miguel situation, this is one I don't know if we've ever really had this type of thing come up because you might have a deal in place so Cincinnati would not pick him up because he wouldn't be there and they're not going to waste an expansion slot on a guy who's not going to be there. And I don't think they would benefit from the sale by doing that. So there are some kind of behind-the-scenes protections for for teams and situations like that. This is MLS that can bend things to make it work. It's been known to happen. Um, So, yeah, we'll have to stay tuned on that one. But, yeah, it's going to be tricky. I'm thinking it's going to be a guy like a Mikey or a Romario or a Wheeler Aminu that would be – potentially picked up um we don't know parkhurst's contract situation we don't know lorenowitz's contract situation any others question marks garza is under contract i would expect him to be protected i think we're right around 11 protected just off the top of the head so it's it's gonna be tricky there's gonna be guys available and I guess last question before we go to break. Colonel wants to know if there's a plan for a Capo stand at MLS Cup if it's played in Atlanta. Don't know. I haven't heard anything. Uh, that, there's no way to know that right now. <laughs> Sorry, Colonel. Yeah. Um, they don't. They don't tell us that sort of thing. So I don't know. It, it's an MLS. It's an MLS deal. So I don't know how they're they're handling it. Um, I know right now because Darren Eels has, has said it many times that for Atlanta United games, Atlanta United purchased the suites underneath where the capo stand is. So those are that's a, a cost that Atlanta United eats to be able to do that. Now, I would assume that if they have the opportunity to, they would do the same thing for MLS Cup Final. And I would like to think that they would have the opportunity to because it's still money going into the pockets. So I'd be surprised if it's not. The reason I said that yesterday, I think there's just been a lot of overreacting on a Tuesday and Wednesday about the MLS Cup tickets. The reason I said that was just because it's a different group selling the tickets. So there's no real logical reason why they would sell that stand to somebody else instead of Atlanta United for the same money. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't expect Atlanta United to say, no, we're not going to spend it now when we spend it all year. I'm assuming it would be there. And Shiva has a question. When do you guys think we'll get the announcement on who the new coach is? After MLS Cup or after the team's eliminated. You're not going to hear anything while the team's still playing, for sure. And then, I mean, is there a deal in place? Is it going to be you know an interview process? But right now, it's it's everything focused on this team winning a trophy. So I would expect that there could be some conversations being had behind the scenes about who and maybe talks and all that, but you're not going to hear anything until the season's over for sure. But then I think you're going to hear something as soon as possible. I think in a perfect world, you have a coach in place by January 1. I mean, because you've got to get ready for CONCACAF Champions League. You've got to get – I mean, because the schedule got even more compressed than it was – last year with all of the other tournaments that you're involved in it is it is it's different i mean you're going to be playing competitive games 10 days before you would have so i mean really it's not that big of a difference it puts it's it's pressurized games instead of carolina challenge cup games at that point it is a little more of an intense preparation because of that it's you know, your training's not going to start much earlier, which is, is something that MLS and the CBA needs to address going into the next one for sure. Um, your training will start about the same time in mid-January. Um, I think you want to coach in place as soon as possible going into the transfer window because you're going to want a player in place when training starts if you're making a big replacement signing. Um, you want that plan in place of what training is going to be 
because it's not like they make it up each day. You know, there is a plan well thought out. These are, are questions you want answered sooner rather than later. So it's not always a perfect world. But I think that would be the goal, would be to have a manager in place uh, by January 1 and honestly as soon as possible after the season ends. Uh, Let's see. And along those lines, Chewy with a question. Do teams who enter CONCACAF Champions League still get bonus TAM and GAM? Hashtag Wildpass Wednesday. Yeah, I don't think that's changed. I don't know the amounts off the top of my head, but they always have. Uh, we'll see if we can grab that during the break and and talk about how that process works. Stay with us. We'll be right back on a Wall Pass Wednesday. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah. Oh. That's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. How could you not love him? Hamilton the Pug, Instagram star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here. November 14th edition of the show. Jason Longshore, John Nelson here with you this morning, taking your questions on a wall pass Wednesday. We'll get into some U.S. women's national team talk here in just a bit. Chewy had a question about receiving allocation money for qualifying for CONCACAF Champions League. And if the MLS rules and regulations are correct, that that we're seeing, it's 140000 for each qualified team. And that would be GAM, not targeted allocation money. There's a bunch of different ways you get allocation money. Um, it, it's a little complicated. And if you don't want your head to start spinning around, you might want to put it on <laughs> mute or plug your ears right now. Grab some every, coffee. Every team that doesn't make the postseason gets 200000 in allocation money. This is all GAM. This is general allocation money. So 200000 if you don't make the playoffs. Uh, expansion year allocation was $1.1 million for the, the last round. We'll see if that's the same, um, if, that, if that continues. I would assume it would probably be in that ballpark. Maybe a little bit more for Cincinnati. I don't know. I think they actually talked about maybe bumping that up because of the restriction on teams, players available, because LAFC, who – when LAFC picked a player from a team, that player or that team is not available to be picked from by Cincinnati. I I think they might bump up the, the general allocation money allotment a little bit, but 1.1 is what it was a hundred thousand to each existing team in an expansion year. So Atlanta United will receive a hundred thousand in GAM annual allocation is 200,000. So, okay, that takes it up to 300,000 for Atlanta United in GAM. Qualification for the CONCACAF Champions League, 140. So now we're up to 440 in GAM. Coming into the year, this is just for being here, 440,000 in GAM. 
transfer transfer or loan of a player to another club outside of MLS allocation of up to seven or outside of MLS. This is really poorly written. Allocation of up to seven hundred and fifty thousand <laughs> for each transfer or loan. That could come into play depending on what happens in the transfer window for Atlanta United. Carlos Carmona deal saw, I believe, 750000 in GAM to Atlanta United for that deal. Third designated player charge distribution. Atlanta United has three designated players, so they are not getting anything in that. They have to basically buy the third designated player slot. The teams that have a third designated player, the money that they paid to have that is then divided among the teams who do not have a third designated player. Yes, it's silly. Free you weren't kidding about that. I'm, making your I'm, head I'm not even done yet. Free agency compensation of 50000 per net player loss. So if Atlanta United loses a player due to free agency, um, Jeff Lorenowitz would qualify if he, was, if he signed a one-year deal at the end of last season and he signed somewhere else in free agency. I don't know if there's another player for Atlanta United who would qualify for the free agency rules as they currently stand. That will be something the CBA, I think, will address, and you will have more players qualify for free agency. Expansion draft compensation of $50,000 for each player selected. That's another $50,000 that Atlanta United could get going into the transfer window for 2019. So 440000 is what you have right now in GAM for existing as Atlanta United because of the expansion year, because of the annual allocation, and qualifying for CONCACAF. You get targeted allocation money for completely separate reasons, and these have changed many times, but this is what was here for the 2018 season. $100,000 in TAM is just an annual allocation. December 2016 announcement of a $1.2 million in additional targeted allocation money for each team. We don't know how much of that's been spent. You could bring forward the $1.2 million of targeted allocation money designated for 2019. So some teams have already used that, Orlando. Orlando. Others, maybe not. Don't know what Atlanta United's used and hasn't used. And then you also, and this was announced in December 2017 have the discretionary $2.8 million of targeted allocation money that the teams can fund. So, allocation money is very complicated. (laughs) It is... That's 5.3 max, is that right? Well, I mean, yeah, if you want to... The 100,000, the 1.2, possibly bringing the 19 over, and then the 2.8. Well, that would have been for 2018. So right. we don't know what has been spent from the 2018 number. We don't know if anything's been brought over. We don't know if anything has been used discretionary. There are some differences in how you use the discretionary versus the allocated. Yeah, again, let's wow. get back to the main point. Allocation money is complicated, and it's monopoly money. Um, it basically allows you to extend your salary cap in a lot of different ways. And it's hard to follow. The league has been getting better about making announcements about when teams use it and when teams acquire it via trade. That's good. Still, I don't think anybody truly knows like what the what the numbers are right now for what teams have, and that would be. I think it'd be a good thing for the league to to publicize. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. If you're going to have the rules publicize them so everybody understands so when we're sitting here breaking down okay what can atlanta united do in the transfer window they've got x amount of gam they've got x amount of tam they've got a designated player slot they've got international slot this is what they can realistically do or this is what they cannot realistically do it's hard to have that conversation because there's so many unknowns then let's see the colonel has followed up he says uh, it is not enough for tata that Mark Geiger has the courage to call any foul any time. He's a coward, afraid to eject, and show necessary red cards. Felipe Cardenas is a hashtag ATLUTD treasure. Look, let's get into this. Um, Tata Martino doesn't like Mark Geiger. I don't think he's the only one. Um, that doesn't mean that Geiger didn't do a good job on Sunday, in my opinion. I, I think he did a pretty good job. The two questions for me were the same two as calling the game. The potential red card to Herrera 
for yep. studs up into the back of Al Marone, and that seems to be the one that, that really angered Tata Martino. Um, and not showing a yellow card to David Villa for undercutting Brad Gazan. I thought that was dirty and cheap. At least a yellow. Those are the big issues I had. Tata Martino's comments, I think, are revolving a lot around player safety. And this is something that's come up with a lot of referees. I think it's bigger than Mark Geiger. Players have to be protected more from reckless endangerment types of fouls. And the Herrera one was that for me, where it's a bad giveaway by Herrera. He's frustrated. Studs up into the back of Al Marone. He didn't make huge contact, and that's probably why he only got a yellow. I think if he had went studs up and got the Achilles or got the calf, one, I think Miguel Almiron probably would have been hurt, and that would have been a red card. What I, where I completely agree with Tata Martino is, okay, in that situation, say Miguel Almiron does get hurt. Say the referee sees it. He's likely going to go red there, right? Because you had a player injured. Yeah. That's, that's normally how it goes. In this case, Miguel Almiron was not injured. He doesn't go red. That, I think, is the issue that Tata Martino is hitting at here. You don't get off the hook because your endangering type of foul didn't actually injure a player. It was less endangering. But it wasn't. That's it what was I'm just saying. less accurate. Right. It's, it's the argument I've always had when I've been on disciplinary and protest committees about if you take a swing at a player and you miss, you still took a swing at the player. You should still be right. red carded. If you yep. throw an elbow and you miss, if you had connected, you might have broken somebody's nose and you'd easily be red carded. But because you miss doesn't mean you should get off the hook. If you spit at somebody and you miss, you still should be red carded. So in this case, Herrera goes in with a type of tackle that can injure a player. He didn't. It's still a potential red card. I don't think it's as much of that's just a Geiger issue. That's a refereeing issue, and I think maybe a little bit more so in this league than others. The only way you get rid of these types of things, if you're, you're looking at it and you're the league and you say, man, we don't want these types of tackles in our league, you have to red card them. And you're going to go through a period of time where players are adjusting to the new way of interpretation, and you're going to have a lot of red cards. Sorry. It's the same thing you're seeing right now in the NFL with targeting. You're seeing a new rule brought in, a new interpretation of the rule. Or I don't, It's not called targeting in the NFL, right? It's, it's called something else, but essentially it's the college targeting rule. Uh, leading with the crown of the helmet. Yeah, it's, it's targeting. Um, yeah, it's targeting. So you're seeing different interpretations of that, and you're seeing some calls right, and you're seeing some calls wrong, and you're seeing some players ejected, perhaps unfairly, and you're seeing some players ejected fairly. Over time, that rule should eliminate players leading with the crown of their helmet because they will know I'm risking being ejected if I tackle this way. You're going to see coaches change the way they coach the game. It takes time, though, and you're, it's going to be bumpy at first. But you got to eat that to get the game right. In this case, I think that's, the, that's what needs to happen in soccer. You have to start punishing these types of tackles more harshly because they are potential injury tackles they are the types of tackles studs up from behind where you have a player out for a long period of time and for atlanta united for any club that invests in attacking players you're bringing these players in on a high price they're very important to your team's success they're very important to the fans who spend the money to come see them and if you're allowing tackles that can endanger their ability to play that's a problem that's a big problem i think it's bigger than geiger I think Tata Martino is still very frustrated about Geiger and the calls from earlier this season, and I completely understand it. But this conversation to me is a little bit bigger than that. And, and yeah, I mean, I completely agree that Felipe Cardenas is an Atlanta United treasure. <laughs> I completely agree <laughs> with that part. Yes. But I, I think the conversation is very big, and it's something the league needs to continue to have. It's, 
it's not good enough as it's been in recent years where the, the referees have points of emphasis going into a year and it seems like they get washed away by May and you're just back to where you were. If you're going to have a point of emphasis that a tackle from behind is a red card offense at all times, then yeah, March and April and May, you're going to have a lot of red cards. Sorry. You want that tackle out of the game. This is something FIFA and soccer has been talking about. Gosh, it's probably the 82 World Cup in a big way. Because you saw how you know a player like Diego Maradona was was hacked down consistently in World Cups and in big games. Other key attacking players just brutalized with tackles. It's not what you want in this game. So you have to call it tight. And if that means you're going to be throwing a lot of reds, you're throwing a lot of reds. You don't want to see that that page flipped going into the postseason where all of a sudden you're calling it differently. I agree with that. But if that's a point of emphasis, it needs to be a point of emphasis. And the referees need to be backed by the league and the disciplinary committee that, no, this is not acceptable. This is not the way we want tackles happening in our league, and we're going to judge it harshly. I agree with with Tata Martino on those types of plays for sure. Let's take a break. Let's come back with some more Wall Pass Wednesday questions. Hour number two, we'll get into the U.S. Women's National Team. Carly Lloyd, a uh, great interview over at the New York Times about how her role has changed going into a World Cup year. That will be her last World Cup. Um, I think it's just a fascinating read on a veteran player who is coming to grips with a different role and how she's handling it. It was really, really interesting. We'll get into that in hour number two. More wall pass after this. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking you questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Final segment, hour number one, Wall Pass Wednesday, soccer down here, November 14th edition. John, what else do we have on the Twitters? Uh, Clayton Poss at East Football 5 0. Hashtag Wall Pass Wednesday. Name three players who you think will be leaving Atlanta United after this season. Three players who I think will be leaving Atlanta United after this season. Uh, Miguel Almiron. One. Because the agent's talking. Uh, he's said that. You know, two years is kind of what we all thought it would be. It seems like there's enough progression there. Barring not getting the offer you want, I, I think he's won. Um, who, I'm going to say... I could generic. No, I'm not going to generic it. I'm going to actually think about it. I'm going to say Mikey Ambrose right. because okay. I think he'll be available in the expansion draft. And if I was Cincinnati yeah. and, and Mikey is going to be okay physically after the injury, that that's a player I would pick. 
because I think he's a starting left back in this league and he just hasn't had the opportunity yet. So that would be the other one. Um, one more. Tanner um, Hildebrandt? No, not necessarily. Uh, could be, but not necessarily. I'm trying to see if there's another player that I think is more likely. Um, Romario? He's he's a possibility because I don't think there's going to be a place for him to play significant minutes here anytime soon. And I think that's what he is angling for, as he should, at his age and in his career. So he's a possibility. Um, I could see a guy like Kevin Kratz as a possibility as well, a Chris McCann. Two veterans who have been very good here and very important, but are probably at the end of their, their contract that they signed here. We don't know for sure. I'm assuming on both that they'd be up against that contract. And anytime you have a veteran at the end of that contract, you run that risk of, of losing them. Could they come back on a lesser salary? Could they come back in a different role? It's possible. But both of them play positions that you have a lot of young players coming through that you probably want to give opportunities to integrate into the squad. So I would go, if I'm, if I'm putting money on three, it would be Miguel, Mikey, and McCann. That would be the three that I would expect. Okay. Uh, I would have said probably Romario was my third, but I was going to go with Mikey and Mickey as, as my first two. I think McCann's more likely because I, I think he's he's at a contract number that, that's tough to justify for the role he's played. Um, I don't think he was on more than a two-year deal, and I think he'd have some opportunities, whether it's in England or with other teams here, to see more playing time at a number he'd rather want. And I just think you have too many players coming through. I mean, left back, you've got even if – Ambrose goes, you have Garza, Bello, Hernandez. So there, there's a lot of depth there. Central midfield, you've got Chris Goslin who's going to be pushing for time here soon. Potentially Oliver Shannon. Um, you've got a lot of options. Gallagher? Gallagher's not central midfield. But just in general, as someone who's going to but be pushing I'm, for I'm, playing. Well, sure. I mean, we could go that all day. But I'm talking about for Chris McCann. Gallagher's emergence doesn't have anything to do with McCann. McCann's a left-sided player or a central player. Gallagher's a right-sided player or a forward. Goslin would affect McCann a lot more. And Goslin's a guy who is going to need to get some time here soon. And I think Shannon's a guy who showed that he can earn that time. So that's two right there that are younger, on a better salary cap number, and probably still under contract. And I think McCann would be coming to the end of his initial contract. So that's why I would, I would say him as the third guy. Nothing would surprise me, though. A lot of it depends on the new manager and who they rate. Because you could see more than a handful of guys leave because new managers bring in guys that they know and, and trust and understand. So that can happen, too. That's why this offseason is going to be very, 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 very interesting. We're going to take a break. Leading into hour number two, we're going to come back, talk Carly Lloyd, talk U.S. Women's National Team. The 2018 calendar year has ended for the Women's National Team. You're going into a World Cup year. We'll, we'll kind of lay things on the table as to how that looks. Going into 2019 for Jill Ellis and the U.S. Women's National Team. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah. Oh. That's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. 
He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. How could you not love him? Hamilton the Pug, Instagram star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two, soccer down here, November 14th. It's a wall pass Wednesday. We'll get into more of your wall pass questions after this, but let's get into the U.S. women's national team. 1-0 win over Scotland yesterday. 1-0 win over Portugal early last week. That finishes the 2018 calendar year for the women. Um, Outstanding article at the New York Times this morning from Andrew Kay about Carly Lloyd. And you see the headline, Carly Lloyd doesn't like the view from the bench. And you're like, oh no, here we go. (laughs) Veteran player doesn't want to be relegated to the bench. We went through a little bit of it with Abby Wambach, and then she ended up becoming a very important part of the 2015 World Cup run from the bench. I thought Andrew's interview with, with Carly and the quotes throughout the article were were so good and so open. I don't think you normally get this type of response from a player like Carly Lloyd. Ag- absolutely acknowledging that, yeah, I don't want to be on the bench. I want to play, and I've got time to, to show that I should be playing in the World Cup. But also not out of line in any way. You know, I mean, she said there's a lot, a lot that can change in seven months. I'm going to fight and push my teammates and try to help in any way possible. Um, it, it's the the perfect way to handle it. And Carly Lloyd has, you know, converted her game from being in the attacking midfield to honestly playing as a number nine and being a finisher and being a a finisher off the bench. It's a uh, it's interesting and. You know, Jarrett Smith's now with us, and, and Jarrett, we've talked about the women's national team and and what would need to happen after the 15-16 cycle. So you win the Women's World Cup, you get knocked out in the quarters of the Olympics for the first time ever. You have an aging core. You, we didn't know how many of those players would carry over to now. And some have, and some haven't. But... It's felt like 2018 has really been the year that Jill Ellis has looked to youth and looked to freshen up this depth chart. And you have a player like Carly Lloyd who is still producing, kind of evolving with her game at her age, but still very productive and still, I think, a very important part of this team. And it feels like Jill Ellis is starting to get that balance between young players breaking through and not hitting a roadblock but also using the veteran experience of a player like Lloyd, even if it's a different role than she's accustomed to. Yeah, I mean, it's a different role, but it's it's good to see. And I think this is what we've been waiting on with this team is uh, I couldn't have pinpointed if you asked me if this is exactly what we meant when we talked about what the women's team needed. I don't know if this is how I could have pinpointed it, but it, it, it at least builds some confidence going into the next World Cup. That's you know a couple months away at this point. That hey, they've got a lot of young, exciting talent. Mallory Pugh is still very young. You know, Rosa Dahl is still very young. Um, Alex Morgan has transitioned from, and it feels like where did the time go when Alex Morgan was that young player to now kind of more of a veteran striker uh, who's trying to kind of find her role and things, and you know, live up to what that billing was when she was young. Um, then you've got a lot of older players who this is going to be their last hurrah and the results, you know, I think you want 
you're, you're we're used to those bigger score lines that we saw against Scotland and against Portugal. But you still got the points. If you go watch, go back and watch the Portugal game. They, I mean, in a different world, they win that game like four nothing, five nothing. Um, what we're used to seeing, technically. But if you know these kind of growing growth and uh, results kind of mean okay, we're finding that balance, then it's absolutely worth it. If if you know you go into this World Cup. And I was I was okay with this World Cup. I thought they would be fine anyway, just because the veterans there would, even if things were a little dysfunctional, could drag things through. Um, but if they're kind of laying the groundwork to help some of the younger players take the next step before they step aside, and there's not a lot of you know chaos, then I feel even better, honestly, about going beyond 2018 because that's where my concern was. Yeah, this is uh this is an interesting group. It's an interesting time in in the the pool. You are seeing a 4-3-3 for the most part and Lloyd has been pushed to the bench in the midfield for Julie Ertz, for Rose Lavelle, for Lindsay Horan. I think Lindsay Horan was possibly the best player in the women's national team pool in 2018. Forward line, you go back to the game against Canada that won the CONCACAF championship. It was Rapino on the left, Tobin Heath on the right, Alex Morgan up top. Back line, it was Crystal Dunn, Becky Sauerbrunn, Abby Dahlkemper, Kelly O'Hara. O'Hara has an ankle injury. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with her in the run-up to the World Cup. Crystal Dunn has played as a left back. She moved into midfield in the game against Scotland after some substitutions. She, she seems to kind of be that problem solver for Jill Ellis. Um, Emily Fox from University of North Carolina got her second cap against Scotland. Dunn played in the midfield. Emily Sonnet, who's played as a center back, she played right back, replacing O'Hara against Scotland. Um, you're seeing different goalkeeper rotations, Alyssa Nair, um, Ashlyn Harris, uh, Danielle Colaprico. It's, there's still questions. But, John, you know, this is the, the defending champs. The U.S. has never defended their Women's World Cup title. Uh, they have always come up short in that next World Cup. The only country to defend their Women's World Cup title is Germany. And this is going back to, what, 2003, 2007, if I'm not mistaken? I think that's right. So, how do you feel about the women's national team after, uh, I think, the best year of the NWSL in its existence? Um, the best quality of play in the NWSL, which is, I think, a big part of the women's national team development. And some new faces and some old faces in this team as you get ready for 2019. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, I've always maintained the notion that the world is catching up to you and how do you respond when that's happening? And yeah, you are right. It was 2003, 2007 for Germany with their back to back. I still think that the competition is as tough as it has always been, if not tougher. I think that the U S will go deep into the tournament, but I don't see them uh, repeating as champs. I, I think Why? that I just, I think that age catches up with them. It's a combination of things. I think age catches up with you. And I think that the world is getting closer to you when it comes to your capabilities and the, the differences of the talent level overall, when it comes to what we've seen in the past, where it was the U S and the U S and the U S and getting everything, but we've seen Germany, we've seen Japan, we've seen Brazil, we've seen Sweden and France and, you know, and England coming closer. I just think that all of these folks coming closer, you're no longer top dog, like way sure. above everybody else. All that's but true. I just think I just yeah. So I just I just think that um, I, I'm looking more toward 23 after this group cycles out. How many games did the U.S. lose in 2018? I believe that would have been zero, wouldn't it? Yeah. So I, I, I hear you. That yeah, there there's more competition. Yeah, you have some some older faces in this group. You won everything in front of you in 2018. You didn't dominate. You didn't blow everybody out every game, but you didn't lose. 
I feel better about this team than I did coming out of 2016. That that's a definite. 2016 worried me, and I would I would have said a lot of those same things in 2016. Yeah, seeing Lindsey Horan and Rose Lavelle and their development, seeing their development, and a player like Morgan Bryan not have a starting spot lockdown. I think that's what makes me feel better about this. You look at the bench in that CONCACAF final. And you look at players like Sonnet, Brian, Lloyd, Pugh, Kristen Press on the bench there because there's better options. That shows more depth than I think we're giving them credit for. And then also some of the young players coming through or the players who maybe weren't part of the rotation before NWSL, a player like Sam Mewis who was not really part of the women's national team pool until her play in NWSL. And, and I think there's more in NWSL. And we've, we've been beating the drum for Lynn Williams for a long time. Amen. She deserves a look. But Alex Morgan, is she scored yesterday. She's doing the job. Carly Lloyd's turning into a, a, a second-half substitute as a forward. It's, it's not something that Lynn Williams would walk into a starting lineup. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. I feel like Jill Ellis has really bridged that gap between the two that I didn't know if she could do this in 2016. I didn't know after coming out of that Olympics that was such a failure. And and the Hope Solo stuff and all of that coming out of it. It felt like an old group that didn't have a future. I give the NWSL a ton of credit for freshening this group up and helping players like Horan and Ertz and Mewis and Dunn continue to improve and become key figures. I mean, Sauerbrunn and Dahlkemp are your two center backs in that CONCACAF final. It's, it's a group that I have a lot more confidence in. And, and I would have been right there with you that I don't expect them to repeat I would have said that two years ago. I probably said it a year ago. I feel a lot better about it. I I don't think it's a guarantee by any stretch that they repeat. Um, I don't think the women's game will probably ever be that way again where it's just obvious there's one country so far ahead of everybody else. I think the competition will be very, very good, and I think it'll be the best women's World Cup that we've seen. Um, That being said, I think the U.S. is one of the favorites, and, and I think they go in potentially as the favorite. Doesn't mean it's a lock, but this group is, has found a way to, to bridge the gap between old and new. And this article about Carly Lloyd and, and her thought process about it is just fascinating to me because how many times, John, have we seen the veteran player who just doesn't want to give it up and then becomes a problem? It's one yeah. thing to not want to give it up. And, and Lloyd is not in any way saying she wants to give it up. She's put in the work. Her teammates have said she's putting in the work. She's one of the hardest workers in this team. She doesn't want to give up her spot. But she is not hurting the team because her spot is being taken by somebody else. That doesn't always happen. And further down in the article, the other quote that stuck with me. I took apart my game and changed a lot of things. I used to be a player who got the ball, and it was point A to B to get to the goal. Now it's about being more sophisticated, putting the brakes on, having my game be unpredictable. And I'm going to be an analogy guy here for a second. When I read that quote, first thing that popped into my mind was Neil Perk from Rush. And I'll explain. Wow. A lot of folks, seriously, so I'll, I'll explain a lot of folks who listen to rock and roll of a certain age will put Neil Peart on the Mount Rushmore of drummers. But he reached a point in his career where he thought he wasn't at his best. So he went to his, his teacher, his number one instructor. And that instructor basically tore down his entire drumming style, built it all the way back up differently, And it included wearing Capizio tap shoes instead of normal shoes or boots or whatever. So 
when you have these people who are at the top of their game understand that things have to be a little different and then they chase after that difference and they're still that top quality. They still want to be that top quality individual, but things are just a little different. You get to see the depth of that person. And I think we're seeing that in Carly Lloyd's desire right now. Okay. You glossed over one very important part of that, that I'm baffled by. What? Why was the, the drummer tap wearing tap shoes? Because what do you do when you're sitting at a drum set? I mean, you're tapping, but what you're, is the, yeah. Does it just help you it's hear it? I guess? To have a better, it's to have a better feel for what you're doing with your feet while you're, while you're hitting the drums below you. Don't it's just, it was for a better, play it was a better sense because of, feel. of that. This is the weirdest sequel to Whiplash <laughs> I've ever heard conceived. <laughs> I'm baffled by the tap shoes. But anyway, I guess it worked. Uh, we're going to yeah. take a break while I try to figure out drummers wearing tap shoes. And we will get into more of your Wall Pass Wednesday questions on the other side. This is a better Stay sense of us. feel. Okay, you could go barefoot. Anyway, we'll be right back. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds. And most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Welcome back. Soccer Down Here, Wall Pass Wednesday. Get your Wall Pass questions in at Soccer Down Here on Twitter using the Wall Pass Wednesday hashtag. Some news updates before we get back into the timeline. One of the strangest ways to learn that a club has hired a new technical director, uh, LinkedIn. DC United appears to have a new technical director in Dane Murphy who had previously been the Real Salt Lake technical director. Uh, Dane changed his LinkedIn page to say that he's the technical director at DC United. So, just judging from his LinkedIn page, <laughs> it looks like DC United has has brought Dane Murphy back into the fold. He played for DC United uh, back in the day. He's 32 years old. He joined RSL after being the head of scouting for the New York Cosmos from 2015 to 2017. So Dane Murphy looks to be moving from RSL after one year to D.C. as the technical director. Very young for technical director role. Um, Depends on how those teams and front offices work as to how the technical director role works there as opposed to like Atlanta United where it's Carlos Bocanegra. Um, it, It can have a lot of different characteristics depending on the club. But interesting that Murphy only spent one year in Utah. So stay tuned, and we'll see if we get an official announcement beyond a, a LinkedIn update. Who knows? 
Garth Lagerway <laughs> was retained as the general manager in Seattle. Now, remember, Seattle has members who, and their season ticket holders are members, who vote on Garth Lagerway's uh, term as general manager. He will be back for four more years because he won the vote. Uh, like 83% of the votes were for him to stay, but it was about 38% of eligible voters who voted. To me, it, it shows that Seattle's doing just fine. There, there's really no need to vote on this because why would you move on from Garth Lagerway at this point? It, at their membership meeting, I thought this was interesting, Jarrett. Adrian Hanauer said that he hopes they can sell out CenturyLink Field regularly in eight to nine years after a boost from the 2026 World Cup. Also talked about potentially having some open full stadium matches next year. They had kind of gotten away from that a little bit. A um, little surprising. I think everybody wants to put Seattle in that same group with Atlanta in terms of drawing huge crowds, but they're not really in that same boat in terms of how often they open the full stadium. Yeah, those days kind of feel like they're not a thing, man. It's um, It kind of feels like this little dirty secret of, it's Seattle, it's MLS. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Seattle, right? Uh, Seattle, I right. I agrees. Um, Seattle isn't in that same boat in terms of attendance right now. Like, they still put 40,000 in there sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll always do it for Cascadia. But, hey, if, if they're feeling, say, if they're feeling to say, hey, uh, we're the kings of that. We would like to attempt to reclaim our throne in terms of having raucous atmospheres and packed houses. Then great. I love it. Feel challenged by Atlanta. Try and raise your own stakes. That goes for everybody who's in a stadium with that capacity. Take it as a challenge. That's awesome because everyone can benefit from that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but they are not drawing the same way. Uh, Playoff match against Portland, your your major rival on a Thursday night. You drew thirty nine thousand five four two. That's very good. That's not the Seattle of old. So, just we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, another thing on attendance. This is interesting too. Minnesota, they have three thousand people on their season ticket wait list. And remember, they're moving into Allianz Field next year in St. Paul going to seat around 20,000. I think it's just under 20. Reportedly, one reason they limited the size was they were going to have to do an environmental impact study that would have taken years to complete if they had built a larger stadium. And reportedly, they do have plans to expand the stadium to 25, I think at least. The, The back and forth, though, from Minnesota fans about the size of the season ticket wait list and was that a good thing or a bad thing, I thought was really interesting. And we've, we've talked a lot about league perception and, and team perception in your market. I was surprised at how many people thought that a 14,000 season ticket capacity and having so many people on the wait list but unable to buy tickets, I was surprised at how many people thought that was a good thing, John, and that was a good thing for the long-term success of Minnesota United as opposed to having more seats and and the you know what crept in was kind of that fear of well we could be like orlando and and this is unfair in my opinion to orlando i'm going to defend orlando on this one they were saying we could be like orlando and expand it to twenty five thousand seats and then not fill it and only draw 16 well they were drawing bad crowds this year because it was an awful product awful hideous horrendous hardcore fans were not going because why it was bad soccer again it goes back to the whole thing there's no obligation to show up because you love the sport if it's a bad product you don't have to be there orlando fans said they're not going to be there and watch a bad product that's their right i don't have a problem with it so i'm not going to talk trash about orlando fans not filling their twenty five thousand seat stadium they filled it when we were there in may when they were on a six game winning streak And it was loud, and it was intense, and it was great. So it was a bad crowd later in the season. They were a bad team. No shock. So Minnesota fans were trying to throw shade at Orlando, saying, well, look at Orlando. They expanded their stadium to 25, and they were only drawing 16. 
where do you where do you stand on this, John? Is this a good thing that they have such a large wait list? Uh, you know, I, I would think maybe if the stadium were larger, I might have a I might sit there and look at the wait list of, of three thousand and fourteen thousand and go, eh, okay, oh, for sure. But in Cincinnati, what you're doing is creating artificial demand. I think what they're the the new stadium in the West End is going to be what mid twenties. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. And considering what they're doing at Nippert, you've created artificial demand, even with the notion of uh, an anticipated expansion of the stadium at some point. Here, I, I think that you're you're regressing in the faith that you have in the Minnesota United fan. It's like, okay, what we're going to do is we're just going to build a 20,000. We're just going to build a 20,000 seater and be cool with it and only have 14 and then three. I think that you're stunting your own growth by doing something like that, especially in the day and age of, of MLS and, and what we're seeing in, in markets with the growth of the sport. I just think that you're stunting your growth here. So Cincinnati, the stadium is now expected to hold between 25.5 and 26.5. So it's going to be a little bit closer to like a stub hub center than Philadelphia or the, the soccer specific smaller stadiums. Um, it went round and round. Like at one point it was going to be 21. At one point it was right. going to be bigger. It, it, some of it is down to the site and, and just cost. So yeah. 25 to 26 is, is what you're looking at with Cincinnati right now. The, the part I don't know about Minnesota is that environmental impact study. And, okay, if you have to get the stadium done, you don't want to stay at TCF Bank a whole lot longer. Totally get that because it wasn't a great feel. Um, it felt like you were in somebody else's house because it was all University of Minnesota stuff. So totally get it. You need to get into your own building. If you have a plan to expand and grow it, cool. Completely fine with having the way you're having it here. It would, for me, what stood out was maybe more of the attitude from the fan base about a fear of filling a bigger stadium. You know, it's it's just such a different perspective because I feel like here, it's bring it on, bring on the challenge, let's do this. Yeah. And in some other markets, there's still, and even Minnesota, which is a new market for MLS, there's that fear of 25 might be too big. That That surprised me a bit. But you look at what they've done at TCF where they haven't really averaged those big crowds. And let's, let's be honest about Cincinnati, too. You know, Cincinnati has had some great crowds at Nippert. Huge crowds. What was their average? What was their Efforting. average attendance? Um, 23, 24? I think is where you're at. So that feels about right. And there is a, there is something to the demand. I, I totally understand that. There is definitely something to managing the demand and creating demand, Jarrett. But just the attitude of Minnesota fans worried that they could fill 25 – it is surprising to me. And I hope that the league can outgrow that in markets across the country soon. I think it's just a process. Um, sometimes it's a slow process. I, I get there's kind of this this fear. You don't want to build it and then have it feel empty. And you just, the studies they do probably point to, hey, here's what we're looking at attendance-wise right now. Um, if we, But there, the, the one thing I will say is I like the, the idea, I like the fact that you've got now more of these teams. If you're building a stadium, Build in the option for expansion, please. Just keep building an op. You have to build an option for expansion because it's better to do that than, you know, build this thing and in 15 years go, well, damn, now we have just, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something small that's, um, you know, that's stadium wise. Um, that you have the Wake Forest of stadiums and everyone else is out here with, you know, Clemson, Death Valley, the Memorial Stadium. Um, just, Build the expansion plan in and give yourself the option down the road, as opposed to building something entirely new. 
I mean, if you want it to be kind of smaller, but kind of a unique feel, um, what pops into mind is uh, up in Inverness in Scotland, Inverness Caledonian Thistle Stadium. It's a smaller stadium, but it's nestled very nicely on the edge of a lock. And it's a wonderful view with a small stadium, but you don't really have that here in the United States where we can say it's a smaller stadium, but <clears throat> the view is amazing. Like maybe Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia, Philadelphia talent yeah. with the bridge. Um, like that I can live with. So, yeah, Philadelphia I can live with on that front. But otherwise, like, you know, Allianz out there in St. Paul doesn't have that feel. So you don't really have anything bringing it you know, a unique small feel necessarily. So give yourself an option to become big. They've done some cool stuff with the the lighting and the way that Allianz will look. I think it'll be a great venue. I think it'll be an outstanding venue and, and definitely look forward to visiting it. Um, yeah, it's just a little surprising. The, the attitude about man, 25 might be too much for us. It, it's a chicken and an egg thing. You know, it comes back to if you, if you shoehorn yourself in and you say that we are a product that will draw 20,000 people and that's it, you're going to be perceived a certain way. If you come in and you say, hey, we're playing in a, in a venue that will have a capacity of 45, okay, you're going to be perceived differently. And then if you're able to, to draw 70 when you expand the whole thing, then, yeah, you're going to get perceived very differently. Seattle was perceived differently because they were able to draw big, big crowds. When you're in a smaller venue, I think it's harder work to overcome that perception. I, I really think 30, at minimum 25, is becoming yep. the, the baseline. 30 is the sweet spot for me of where you want it to be to start, but having that plan to expand. SC Cincinnati, lowest home attendance, 22.5, highest 31.4, average 25.717. Yeah, so 25.5 to 26.5 in a new venue, more bells and whistles. That's that's pretty reasonable, to be honest. Because it's not like Cincinnati came out of nowhere and just drew this one year or for one game or whatever. It's You kind of have a, an idea of where the fan base is. Now, you would expect that it grows with MLS, and, and that's something you'll have to deal with over time. But it feels like a good start. Nashville is going to be between 27.5 and 30 for their their stadium at the fairgrounds. Um, I'm curious to see what Miami does. I, I want to see what the size of that venue is going to be and, and what the expansion plan could be. So interesting stuff as the league continues to grow, and we'll, we'll try to give you a, a snapshot of how that looks in different spots around the league as we go. More of your Wall Pass Wednesday questions after this. Stay with us. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah, that's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. I do not love him. Hamilton the pug, Instagram star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. 
Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer Down here, November 14th edition. Jason Longshore, John Nelson, Jarrett Smith with you this morning. We're taking your Wild Pass Wednesday questions. Tweet them at us at Soccer Down here. Also, while you're on your laptop, on your phone, check out EnclosedLingerie.com. E-N-C-L-O-S-E-D, Lingerie.com. Multi-month gift opportunity if you're looking for something for the special woman in your life. You can save some money by being a soccer down here listener. You go to enclosedlingerie.com, use the code down here at checkout, and you get $35 off a multi-month gift. You're looking for a birthday gift. You're looking for a holiday gift. This is something that's a little different than your, your flower of the month, beer of the month, and also have the 100% size guarantee. Enclosedlingerie.com. Thanks for sponsoring soccer down here. Let's get back into the Wall Pass Wednesday timeline. John, we have a question, I believe. Yes, Jacob Austin wants to know, if Romario is lost in the expansion draft, who fills his spot? Is it Vasquez, Aconquo, or an un, uh, as-of-yet-unknown, unnamed player? It could be Tito Vialba as a backup forward, which he's been at times. It could be... Patrick Oconquo coming back from loan at Charleston Battery. It could be Gordon Wild on a Generation Adidas deal coming back from loan at Charleston Battery. It could be a new signing. It could be Jackson Conway signing a homegrown deal. It could be John Gallagher as a forward who can also play on the right side. Did I miss anybody? I think those are the most likely options. I mean, Lagos Kunga uh, see, can there's play some, there's forward, some but he's more of a winger. Yeah, like there's Devin Sandoval, or not not Devin Sandoval. Excuse me, Yosef no. Samuel. If he would been healthy and taken yeah. the jumps that you'd have liked to have seen last year, but he really didn't get a chance to. And he's more of a winger too. I think. Yeah, I think he can physically play the position, but but yeah, I, I I like him better on the wing. But I think if you had to ask him, hey, I need you to be the guy up top late in the game, man, I I, I would trust Yosef to do that. Sure, but. Yeah. Vasquez, yeah, Vasquez is in the mix too. Um, I think those are your options. So you have options, but yeah, I mean, this is the this is the problem that happens when you have a successful team. <laughs> You're going to have some turnover because players want more playing time, and teams want players from good teams. So there you go. Um, I think Romario showed some good stuff late in the year in USL. And he showed some stuff at different points in the MLS season, although it was a little inconsistent for him. So I could see a team taking a flyer on him. I could also see him sticking around and and being in a comfortable spot where he knows he's going to get minutes as a reserve with the first team and as a key player with the second team. So he's one that I could see go either way. Sherbs, in response to our... Uh, run of play discussing what's going on at Allianz and Cincinnati and places like that. Either way you look at it, you want the supply to be less than the, than the demand. Atlanta does the same thing, even with the highest demand in the country. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you want that for a long term because Atlanta United could open the whole stadium up tomorrow and sell a bunch of tickets and probably make more money in the short term. But Darren has been really consistent. Arthur Blank has echoed this, too, about wanting to protect the special environment that you get at an Atlanta United match. And it is different when it's 70,000 versus 45. When it's 45, that is the most intense of the hardcores. When it's 70, you get a lot of casual fans who are new and might not know the chance, might not know the traditions, might not know what a game day is like. It takes time to build that, and I think that's why you're seeing a steady rise in full stadium games, but not just opening the doors up completely, working towards it. That's the key. Was what, seven full houses so far this year? Is it seven? 
I think so. If you're including, if you're up to date, I think the number that that was put out there, I think, was seven. Might be right. Six next year to start, plus postseason, potentially any other CONCACAF or whatever. So, yeah, I would expect to be more next year, too. But you're going to work towards a full stadium situation on a regular basis, not just do it and take that short-term money. And when you compare, and now let me just ask this, since, since Jarrett and I are stuck behind relatively soundproof glass and you and Mike have windows open, what's the biggest difference between 45 and 70 coming through those windows? Or how is it different coming through those windows? It's, it's different when it is lit when it's fully lit at 70 it's it's more people screaming i mean it's just an easy thing there but at times it can feel with 70 where it gets quieter for longer i think just because of the sheer number of people and again it's not the same people who are there week in week out so that's what i kind of lean to is the difference um when you can get to where it's 70 chanting sha la la and doing more than the just the atlanta united chant back and forth or the viking clap you know this was something that came up yesterday about chants and songs and how you hear a lot of the same ones in different places that's not unique to mls by the way i think some people look at that again as another opportunity to say oh look at mls fans (laughs) hoo 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 this happens everywhere. You hear it in Scotland. You hear it in England. You hear it in others. There are, there are certain songs and, and things that are just known as soccer songs. Now, the good supporters group put their own twist on it, and I think Atlanta's done that with a Viking clap, for example. It, it has a, a unique little ATL twist to it, and it works for Atlanta. Other clubs do the Viking clap. Seattle's done it. Other clubs do it in the league now. That it's become a bigger deal. Iceland did it. We know it. I think it came from Scotland, right, Jared? Yeah, Motherwall did it uh, in Scotland. Uh, Stjarnjarn in Iceland did it. Uh, I think Stjarnjarn got it from Motherwall in a Europa League game, if I'm not mistaken. But I would be willing to bet money that Motherwall got it from somebody else. It probably yeah. didn't start there. It doesn't end there. Everyone's done things and put their twists on things. It's hard to sit here and claim one thing. And that's exactly. the fun part of it is, you know, you go, you know, I, uh, Scotland probably learns it from somebody. Stjarnjarn sees it. Stjarnjarn's a really fun club, by the way, if you're looking for something in Iceland to follow. Uh, they're the ones that do the weird celebrations. Um, but, you know, then Iceland sees it like, let's do that. And then it becomes their thing. You see it become Atlanta's thing, and they put a twist on it. It's fun. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't worry about stealing something from someone else. It's it's like, you know, put a twist on your own stuff, but have fun and have a fun atmosphere, however it takes. Yeah, let's let's be real about it. If if you're going to do a brand new unique chant that's never been done before, what are the chances that you're going to get 45,000, let alone 70,000 understanding it and going along with it? Very small. Very 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 small. But if you do a Viking clap that a lot of people have seen and now a lot of people have seen connected to Atlanta United, what are the chances that's going to spread through 70,000 people? Pretty good. Pretty good. So the chances of Seven Nation Army going through 70,000 people. Yeah, most people have probably seen that or heard that at a game before, and it's going to happen. But doing a unique chant based on a song from Outcast that you might not pick up the words if you're on the other side of the stadium in a huge venue like Mercedes-Benz Stadium, that might be tough. That's the differences here. So it's not a bad thing when people sing songs that everybody knows. I mean, you go to a bar and you get late in the night. You're not playing, at least if you're at a good bar, you're not playing the obscure album track from Journey. You're playing Don't Stop Believing," and everybody at the bar is singing along, right? That's, that's not a bad thing. So you're not breaking out Girl Can't Help It? Well, you might get thrown out of the bar because people will be like, why did you play that at 1 o'clock when I want to sing along to songs and have a good time? You're thinking about yourself there instead of the whole bar. 
and and that's something. Hey, this is what comes up with when you're dealing with supporters groups and how this works. Like it's a different thought process when you're trying to project to seventy thousand as opposed to five, as opposed to ten, fifteen, twenty, forty. These are different thought processes altogether. When you're projecting to a bigger crowd, every great band has talked about this. When you are a front man in a small club, you can make eye contact with almost everybody in there. And people will follow what you're doing because they can literally see you. When you're playing in a theater, okay, it's still more intimate. You're playing in an arena. It's a different conversation. You're playing in a stadium. Forget it. It's a whole different conversation. Everything you do has to be very big to project to the people in the back of the the venue. It's kind of the same thing with a supporters group and this this side of it. So you're going to have your stuff that people know and, and people understand and easily translates. Atlanta United call response easily translates. I think the Viking clap is to a point now where it easily translates. Some other stuff... Maybe not yet, but it can keep growing. It can keep working that way. You know, when a band plays a new song, not everybody's singing along from day one. Only the hard, hard so chords are heard it on a bootleg. No, it's not even that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like a song that will be big. It's not about just playing a new song because you're, you're a 50-year-old band and you're playing a new song because you're out playing your greatest hits tour. I'm talking about... Nirvana, when they debuted, smells like teen spirit. Okay, nobody knew it the first time. Okay, you come back to that same place a month later. The hardcore fans know it because, like, holy crap, this is a great song. I know this song now. I love this song. Okay? The rest of the crowd might be like, I've never heard this song before. It's not on an album yet. What? What? Wow. Okay, cool. You come back again, more people are singing it. You come back when that song's a hit, everybody's singing along and the place, the roof comes off. That's kind of what I've seen with Sha La La with Atlanta United games. When it first happened, it's like, okay, I can hear it from where I'm at in the venue. That's interesting. Then you start to hear more people singing at the next game. Then more people singing at the next game. Then it becomes a big thing in a 45,000-seat venue. I don't know if the 70,000-seat venue understands that just yet, but it's getting closer. And Jacob says that from his spot in 101, 45,000 is more intense and better than 70,000 every time, except for maybe three days ago. And there are five A's and maybe. The one word I would maybe caution against there is better because a 70,000 venue, and like Jacob said, for, for the playoff game, it was different than other times it's been 70,000. 70,000 when you see when you see your favorite band in that stadium venue you might like them more in the the smaller place for sure because you have that personal connection and it feels more yours but man when everybody is singing along to that song that you love and everybody is on board with it that's goosebumps that's a whole different thing so I love what Atlanta United's trying to do in terms of growing it to where 70,000 feels like the 45. And I I love that they're doing it with the understanding that that's not going to happen overnight. That takes time. And I love that the supporters groups are adjusting the way they project when it's a bigger crowd, when it's a smaller crowd. I thought the way that it was managed, the crowd engagement on Sunday was outstanding. And I thought it was the best large crowd that has been in the bins. And the supporters groups get a ton of credit for that because you can't do as much of the more obscure stuff in that bigger crowd because they don't, it doesn't project as well. And you went to some of the call response stuff. You went to some of the easier stuff to get everybody engaged it's uh it's 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 an interesting thing and and I I have just so much respect for the people who are thoughtful about that on the supporters group side and think about how to make it bigger than just the small group because I think that's what some supporters groups struggle with around the league is they play to the people in their club and the, the people in their clique as opposed to the full venue 
and it, it doesn't come off the, as well as it could. I think here it comes off really, really well because I hear from people all the time who are not hardcores and don't know the supporters group culture. Wow, that's really cool. How do I become part of that or how can I join in? It seems like that happens more here than anywhere else, and it's, it's a credit to the supporters groups and the way they manage themselves. Let's take a final break. Let's come back with more Wall Pass Wednesday after this. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative, and that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking you questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Anytime I get to, to drop a concert and, and music stuff into our conversation here, you know I'm going to take it. So thanks for indulging well, me accurate, on, the, on the Nirvana smells like teen spirit analogy. Um, but yeah, well, it feels well, but like you started, But you started with a grunge thought about today being what today is anyway. So you, the That's show has weird. gone full yeah. circle. I didn't even think of that. I, I wish like sometimes I, I thought through those things and could say like, yeah, I, I had this whole thing about it. it's raining this morning and I was driving around and I was listening to mud honey. And then I was like, man, it's a grungy kind of day. I'm going to put on a flannel shirt and I'm going to talk about Nirvana. Like none of that happened. It just, it just popped out of my head because I don't know. Most underrated Nirvana song ever. You know, you're right. Ah, that's a different thing altogether because it, it was a great song, but, and it, it didn't see the light of day until, what 2004 2005 um yeah i'm not going to put it there because i think it's in a different conversation altogether as one of those posthumous releases um which it was great most underrated nirvana song ever oh man um and jared's not a big nirvana fan so he's not going to contribute here because they're they're close they're not in the 80s but they're early 90s and i think there's overlap and Jarrett does not yeah. like the '80s and early '90s culture. Man, me in the '80s, we we, yeah, we went our separate ways a long time ago. Early '90s too. 80. Early '90s, not as much. Okay. I think the only thing I got into from the '80s was like Black Flag. Okay, and that was later Black Flag, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. So Rollins. Um, yeah, even a little bit before Rollins, um, but eh, the '80s and I don't get along. The '90s and I are fine. Um, yeah, my my, and so I don't get stabbed by anybody. My issue with Nirvana is that they're not my favorite. I think they are very important to our music culture. They're just not Agreed. my favorite. Yeah. Oh no, that's fine. That that's completely yeah. fine. You won't get stabbed, at least by me, anyway. Um, yeah. Most underrated Nirvana song, and I'm, I'm I'll go truly underrated here. Francis Farmer will have a revenge on Seattle from In Utero. That's an awesome song. That's one when I'm like looking for a deep dive into Nirvana. That's the one I'll usually pull out. That or Serve the Servant from In Utero. 
in Euro as a whole was just crazy to see a band come off of Nevermind and, and everything they did and go as dirty and grungy and loud and nasty as, as you could go within Utero. And, and they, they did it and made it work. Um, so then what did you what think of the later. MTV unplugged performance? Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, it was the unplugged performance that, okay, I'm dating myself. I recorded on a VHS tape. I dubbed it to a audio cassette tape. Yeah, this is what we had to do back in the day before they released it as an album. And I listened to it nonstop after that was debuted on TV. And it was, that was late 93. It was four months later when, when Kurt committed suicide. Um, and then it's, since then, it's very hard for me to watch the uh, Where Will You Sleep Tonight at the very end where they cover Lead Belly, which, again, Nirvana covering a blues song from the first half of the 20th century is nuts. But where he screams and then opens his eyes and stares into the camera and finishes it, I, I can hardly watch that. And for years, I couldn't. I wasn't a gigantic, I mean, I wasn't, like, following Nirvana around. I never had a chance to see them live. Um, but I was a big fan, and I think where I really became a big fan was In Utero and Unplugged and where I thought they were going. Because it never mind was great, but I loved their next moves because they were so different than most bands at that time. So I had a ton of respect for where they were headed, and we unfortunately never got to find out. All right. Now that we've brought everybody down on a grungy Wednesday. Let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so are you a Foo Fighters guy now, too? You know, I've never liked the Foo Fighters as much as Nirvana. I like the Foo Fighters. I think they're probably one of the the great rock bands of, of today and of the last 10 years. But I don't have the same emotional pull to the Foo Fighters as I did with Nirvana. <laughs> I think it has to do with time, like when when you were exposed to it as well, because like, oh, absolutely. for instance, um, like I was younger when Color in the Shape comes out for Foo Fighters. Meanwhile, like when In Your Honor comes out, I think I was a freshman or a sophomore in high school. We wore that thing out just constantly because it was the right age where some of that stuff came out where it's like, oh, I'm already into this. OK, well, I guess we're diving head first into the shallow end here. I loved uh, I loved their first record, um, which was mostly a Dave Grohl solo record. Um, this is a call, still a great song, and I get I get jacked up every time I hear that. Um, they've put out some great stuff here lately too. Like I just I love that there's still music that I get that feel for, like I do about a great match or a great play in a match. Um, there's still songs of all genres that I hear and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And I'll deep dive into that song or that artist or whatever. Um, I, I, that's what I love about music. That's what I love about soccer. You know, that's, I, I think there's a lot of similarities between the two. And I think that's why a lot of times they're very linked and, and you see like lots of correlations between, you know, the, the music fandom, the music culture and, the soccer culture and soccer supporters culture. Uh, Sherbs has chimed in on the Nirvana discussion saying, okay. we all know what's, her, we all know what's her name. Did it. The suicide is hashtag MLS oh, narrative. Black helicopter theory on Nirvana. Yeah. I mean, there, there's been documentaries about that. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think there was enough evidence to prove that. Uh, th what I'll say about that is the most intense show I ever saw and it will never be topped was Hole at the Masquerade fall of 94. Like, gosh, it was October of 94. So six months after Kurt's suicide when... Courtney Love probably should not have been in public because she was already a mess, let alone after that happened. Yeah. But yeah. 
an intense rock show. I remember this show. That's the only show that I've been in where I could not control where I was standing. Um, they started, and it felt like the floor of the masquerade turned into a trampoline. And I remember bouncing from... We were right in the middle, like front half of the room in the middle. We bounced close to the left wall. We bounced towards the back where the bar was. We bounced up, crushed up against, like not up against the stage because there were a bunch of people in front of us. But it was that type of just, oh, my God, type of atmosphere. Um, yeah, and then we ended up getting out of the, the crush of the crowd and, and standing off to the side of the stage, which was really cool. And, I mean, we were... I don't know how we pulled it off. We were on the side of the stage, like not on the stage, but if you remember the old masquerade, there was like space over there and we were able to get in that space and watch the show from the side of the stage. It was nuts. There's no way that floor was proper. Like there's no, oh, way. no, 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 not, not by the end. Was. This, this was 94 where, I mean, Dude. it was, it was the supporter section at RFK type of bouncy. Um, yeah, fifteen last years time, later. <laughs> last time I was in there was I think 2012, 2011, and it was it was basically a trampoline, and it wasn't even a me- like a metal or a heavy heavy rock show, right? And it was it was uh, you stopped moving, you felt it. <laughs> you just I just imagine people in hell underneath your under in the lower room just looking up at the dust. Just probably coming down on their heads. <laughs> yeah, Might be the asbestos old, too. I don't uh, know. You never know. The the old masquerade. Um, God bless them. We're definitely in some stoppage time. And if you guys have any more topics, questions, go ahead and hit them real fast. Wall past Wednesday at soccer down here. Couple news and and notes to touch on before we go. Steve Ralston is looking for a new job. Matias Almeida has brought his entire coaching staff from Chivas. No surprise. That's that's pretty typical for how it goes. So don't be surprised if that type of thing happens in Atlanta, where you see Tata Martino take a lot of his staff with him. Maybe not all, but a lot. And you see whoever comes in bring a lot of staff with them. That's, that's very typical these days um, in the world of soccer. So Steve Ralston's a guy that I'll be curious to see where he lands. I thought... He did a pretty good job with San Jose at the end of the season. And he's a guy who's been an assistant for quite a while now. Does he want to take a head coaching gig in USL to get that head coaching experience? Does he want to go be an assistant somewhere? He's got a lot of connections in the game. So keep an eye on Ralston. Uh, He's a guy who should land on his feet here. New England and Chelsea are working on a friendly for 2019. Very cool thing that Robert Kraft is putting together. Uh, a match at Gillette Stadium next summer to, quote, raise awareness of the evils of anti-Semitism and as well as to raise significant funds to combat it. Uh, Kraft announced his intention to host the Friendly at the World Jewish Congress in New York last Wednesday. Uh, Both Kraft and Roman Abramovich are Jewish, and they will both donate $1 million of their own money to the cause, along with all the proceeds from the match's ticket sales. So, very cool thing um, for Kraft to do here. And that's a big high profile friendly that'll get a lot of attention in new England. So good for good for the revolution to have that coming. The red bulls they're in talks with betting companies for deals that would include the naming rights to red bull arena. Sounds kind of odd because red bull owns red bull arena and it's got red bull on it, but this has been going on for a little while. Um, according to sports business journal. So stay tuned now that the betting thing is becoming a thing. Maybe you see a new deal at Red Bull Arena and a new name for it. Be curious to see it. Um, some rumors before we go. The Red Bulls uh, now build has a new report in Germany that Tyler Adams will be going to RB Leipzig in January. No surprise. We've been hearing this for a while, but it's still being talked about. So my guess is it's pretty close to actually happening. We'll see. Um I would assume that it does. I think that's probably the next step for him. Minnesota's linked to a center back out of Colombia, Eddie Segura from Atletico Huila, first division club in Colombia. He's a center back who can play right back. Um, He's been linked out of reports in the Colombian press. So stay tuned there. Uh, Would he pair with Calvo? Would he replace Calvo? Would he replace Boxall? 
Callman, they've just resigned to a new deal, but I think he's more of a depth piece in the long term. So Minnesota looking to upgrade defensively. And a manager that I think MLS teams should be looking at is Antonio Mohamed, uh, El Turco Mohamed, who was just fired by Celta Vigo after a slow start in Spain. He's won titles in Mexico. He's had a lot of success in Mexico. LA Galaxy, maybe, could be a potential spot for him. Um, we'll see what other jobs might or might not open up in MLS. I mean, obviously, I think jobs in Mexico, Mohamed would be an easy fit there. He's bounced around in Liga MX before. But I'd like to see these types of managers be pursued by MLS now. And I think, you know, Martino coming, Almeida coming, you're starting to see more of this. Mohamed would be one to potentially consider. And if the Galaxy... Don't get Burhalter. Don't get Scaloto if they strike out on both of those. Antonio El Turco Mohamed could be a very interesting backup plan. Lower division news before we go. Birmingham Legion have signed former NYCFC midfielder Mikey Lopez. That's a very good signing. Lopez is a player that I thought should have had an MLS job last year. I think he is a, an MLS level player, and that's a good piece for Birmingham to build around. Joe Cole. Chelsea legend, England legend, has retired from the game. Uh, Tampa Bay Rowdies is where he's finished his career. Great signing for the Rowdies and a great ambassador for that club. Um, He's talking about wanting to go into coaching. We'll see if that's in England, see if maybe he could be enticed to get involved in coaching in the United States. Be a good thing for the game here. And a little bit of controversy in Pennsylvania. Bethlehem Steel will not be playing at their current venue any longer. It doesn't meet USL standards at Lehigh University. It doesn't have lights. You couldn't play night games there. So I'm not surprised it doesn't meet standards any further. I'm surprised that it met standards, period. The Steel will be playing at Talon Energy Stadium in Chester. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be double headers with the union, if they're going to play separately. I don't know how that's going to look. Um, Ground screw will have to do some better work at Talon Energy, that's for sure. But some people very frustrated by it. I don't know what other options there were in the market to stay in in and around Bethlehem. I know it's not ideal, but you can't play in a stadium that doesn't have lights. Not in 2018. That's just not okay anymore. So I don't know what else they can do unless they're working on building something there or adding lights or what have you. Kind of felt like this was inevitable, John. Yeah, and, you know, I, I want to see how it shakes out with the whole idea of is it double headers? But I think that right now it makes the most sense to, to go to Talon Regroup and try to figure things out. Uh, I, I know that there was also a mention of a couple of games being brought back into the Lehigh Valley during the season and trying to figure that out as well. But uh, that right now it just seems for the best. And, you know, to your point, you sit there and say, okay, you don't have lights. Come on. Yeah. I mean, you could do some afternoon specials at at Lehigh Valley and and play there, but you can't play a league schedule in a venue that doesn't have lights. It's just not feasible. And uh, I think uh, also lower division news, I think uh, Evio Cordovez signed with uh, Memphis yesterday. Cordovez signed with Memphis, uh, former Charleston Battery, former Richmond Kickers. Chattanooga Red Wolves have so- signed former Real Monarchs forward Juan Mare. Um, the Red Wolves now have six players on board. Very, very uh, interesting. Um, Big day for them tomorrow. Signings start to pop up. And, yeah, they will be unveiling their branding, their logo, their crest tomorrow evening. So stay tuned to... Chat Red Wolves with two T's. Chat Red Wolves on Twitter and on Facebook. Chattanooga Red Wolves SC as they unveil their branding. Seem to be clicking along pretty nicely. And if I'm not mistaken, I I think I spotted some Red Wolves uh, front office folks at Mercedes-Benz over the weekend, which doesn't surprise me. I mean, you're going to try to learn from, from clubs that are doing things the right way. Atlanta United obviously doing things the right way. So Greenfield Triumph have been down. Um, we know South Georgia Tormenta has been in town. No Birmingham Legion's been in town. So, yeah, picking the brain of, of an MLS team that's doing well makes a lot of sense. And it's great for Atlanta to, to also engage in those conversations and help grow the game around the Southeast because that is, a I think, a big part of the responsibility that Atlanta United's taken on for being Soccer City USA and <laughs> Easily the soccer capital of the South. Any final 
things on a wall pass Wednesday that we need to touch on, John? I think we're good. There was one other signing that uh, has slipped my mind at the moment, but of course, being 426 years old, that happens a lot. We'll bring it up tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for indulging us in our, our musical discussion. That was a lot of fun. Um, we can always go down that road anytime we need to. And thanks, everybody, for listening as, as much as you have all week and lots of great questions. We'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m., Thursday Thoughts edition of the show. We will get into USA England tomorrow and talk about what lineups could look like, what we're looking for out of that, what we're looking for out of these games just the international window and how it's going to affect the MLS. Players. No injuries. No injuries is the big thing for Brad Gazan um, and Tyler Adams and Aaron Long. We don't want to see the series decided by injuries. We want to see the two best teams in MLS history battle it out at full strength to determine who's the best one in 2018. 11:50 USA U17 women against Cameroon in the first match of the U17 World Cup for both teams. That's on FS2. Uh, I think friend of the show, Glenn it. Davis, is calling that one, isn't it? Uh, I haven't seen the, the assignment, but Glenn gets a lot of those games. So if it's Glenn, that would be great because Glenn is very good at his job. Um, so check that out as the U-17s open up their World Cup campaign. Thanks for listening. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha playoffs, y'all. <laughs>